comes out for everybody here. I notice there are seven on the participant list. So for everyone in any case, uh, first of all, we will try to start at four o'clock, which is our Eastern Standard Time, or 1 p.m., which is the Pacific time. That's our start time. So that's like three minutes away. And so my role is going to be that I have the list sequentially of the 25 posters in this session. So I will introduce each poster in sequence. And I would uh, like for the presenter for that poster to be ready to start their presentations uh, once I finish announcing the name. And at that point, if you would in fact tell us that you are ready to start, so you could just say ready, then I will start a timer because I've been told that I should stay reasonably close to the three minute time limit. So I would start the timer at that point, And then at the two minute mark, I will issue a verbal notice that you have one minute left. So the expectation is that you would finish up within that one minute so that then we can go to the poster number two and so on down the line, okay? So that's our main uh, kind of uh, mode of action here. One other thing that I think I was sent as instruction is for everybody to see that they or check that their microphones are working and uh, uh, that is the audio is working and Afterwards, uh, then uh, I think you would just unmute when you're ready to speak. And uh, then we can continue in that manner. So I think by my time over here, I'll actually try to read that in terms of uh, the Pacific time. It is showing 12.59. So we will get started in one minute. So... Once we get started, I will announce the first paper, the first poster, and the present the author's names, and then the presenting author. So one last thing that I would also like for uh, the presenters to help us with is uh, to be there once I announce the names, so that you can then set up your presentation and get started. As I mentioned, you could say, I'm ready, then I will start the clock at that point. All right, so I have got seven participants at this moment, which I hope that the number would grow as we continue further. So I will now, we are right at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific. So let me get started at this point. The first poster that we have on the list, the title of the poster or the paper is Decoding the Atomic Structure of Cement Hydrates. And the authors are Chi Zhu and Matthew Boshi. I have it here that the presenting author is Matthew Boshi. So is Matthew Boshi present. You could unmute your mic if you are here, then we could get this thing started. Okay, Dr. Ren, I see you are there as well. Uh, should we, do you think, be playing an MP4 because I'm not hearing from the presenter? Yeah, I think M. he's not here, and uh, he did not uh, send us the uh, video, so... Uh, so are we wait. going to skip that one then? Shall we skip the video then? And move on to I poster number two? One. Could you suggest whether... Yeah, uh, I think we should, uh, yeah. So there was no video sent, and I'm noticing that Matthew Boshi is not here either, it seems. Right? 
we have another co-author there, Chi Zhu, but I don't believe the co-author is here either. So would you suggest we go to number two then? Yeah, I, I think it's better to just escape the <laughs> oh, first. Okay. Okay, okay. So looks like uh, we have to now move to poster number two. Poster number one turned out to be an absence, uh, an absent uh, poster. Uh, I'm sure the organizers will know what to do regarding those. So I will announce the second poster then at this point. And the title of that one is Modulation of Mechanical and Luminescence Properties of boronils through side chain engineering. The authors are Khalid Naim and Prakash Nilakan, Nilakantan. And our presenting author is Khalid Naim. So I am waiting to see whether Khalid Naim is here. Unfortunately, it appears I don't see Khalid Nain's name here either. Uh, okay, so are we playing the video or it looks like Dr. Ren is playing the video, right? Yeah, since he is okay. not here, okay. yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. so, so I do appreciate it. Just a minute. Go ahead and play that then. The title of my today's presentation is Modulation of Mechanical and Luminescence Properties of Oranis through Sidechain Engineering. So organic pi conjugated molecules have captured growing interest because of its ability to self-assemble in one-dimensional nanomicrostructures. And further, these structures were used in various optical electronic devices. Today, I'll be talking about these uh, boronyl molecules, which are basically the boron complexes of the shift bases. And when I try to crystallize these compounds, I found a very interesting flexible the crystals uh, to some of these molecules. So generally, we know that the crystals are known for their brittle nature. The moment we apply pressure, it would shatter into many pieces. But the elastic crystals are those crystals when we apply pressure and the moment we release, it again take their original shape. Whereas the plastic crystals, it deformed permanently. But these crystals would not uh, shatter into pieces, which generally the brittle crystals are. Similarly, we got one of the molecule, molecule two, forming this organogel, which is luminescent. So our objective is to design some boronyl molecules, different functional group, different side chain. And can we use this material as a flexible optoelectronic property because these crystals are flexibility. So this is the reaction scheme for two-step reaction. First, we make the shape bases and further the uh, boron complexes and what this boron is. So in one of the projects, I uh, change the side chain uh, with the butyl amine to the haptochlorobutyl amine and we nicely got uh, this for the butyl amine these flexible crystals and with the chloro chain we got this uh, gel organogel which is luminescent and these crystals are very nice long rod shape and we can also like uh, deform because they are plastic in nature so this we thought can we use this as an optical waveguide and we have calculated the optical loss coefficient and we got very nice values. Similarly, we want to quantify the hardness and the elastic modulus of these materials. So we did this nano indentation study in different phases of the crystals. Similarly, this gel molecule we use as a security marker because uh, this is not this is luminescent uh, in UV light and it is not visible in ambient and it is also having this uh, near super hydrophobic material. And this uh, naphthalene core chlorochain having very nice flexible crystals with size dependence. So the crystals which are bigger are having this plasticity and the thinner are these elastic crystals. And the crystal packing clearly shows that the role of slip planes to generate this flexibility. And these chains are basically uh, creating this uh, slip plane. And because of that uh, packing, we got this flexibility. So as a conclusion, we synthesize this molecule and use some of this material as optical wave guiding and some uh, properties. The title of my today's presentation is Modulation of... Thank you so much. 
I think uh, we'll now move on to paper number three, poster number three. The title is Three-Dimensional Model in Assessing the Pore Geometry of a Biomaterial Intended for Implantation. The authors are Zaneta Garzik and Sebastian Stach. And the presenting author we see from the list is Zaneta Garzik. And I believe our presenter is present here. So if you can set up your presentation, then uh, we'll get started with that. Is Dr. Garzik here? I believe she is here minutes ago. Okay, and should we want, because we do have an MP4 that came from her also. Should we play that? She had actually inquired with us on the chat that do you have our MP4? <laughs> so I don't know whether she was going to present it live or whether we should in fact fall back on the on the video. And Dr. Ren, you may then help us out by playing the MP4. But before you do that, I just wanted to mention to everybody that if there are research related questions or whatever in relation to these posters, uh, there may be some time left over later on. If not, then you can always send messages by the chat link or you may correspond via email because I think every presenter has their email in the program list. So there may be ways of continuing with any discussion relating to the research. Now try to play this. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Żaneta Garczyk. I represent University of Silesia in Katowice in Poland, Faculty of Science and Technology and Institute of Biomedical Engineering. The topic of my poster is Three-dimensional model in assessing the pore geometry of a biomaterial intended for implantation. The model creation process consisted of three main stages. The first step was to establish the assumptions of the model. As part of this stage, I performed measurements using a confocal scanning laser microscope. Samples of porous corundum biomaterial produced by chemical foaming constituted the research material. Then, I analyzed the images obtained with a microscope. The analysis enabled the segmentation of pores and their measurement. Based on the obtained parameters, I adapted assumptions of the model. The next stage was the model implementation in the MATLAB environment. Then I carried out computer simulations which resulted in generating a three-dimensional representation of the porous biomaterial, its cross-sections and parameters characterizing the geometric dimensions of the pores. Thank you for your attention and I invite you to email contact. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Ren, and our thanks to the presenter of this poster. This was our poster number three. And once again, a quick reminder, uh, anybody interested can communicate with the presenters or their groups, either using the email contacts that are there, or maybe uh, send a note on the chat link that we have here. Or maybe there would be, as I was mentioning, some time left over uh, by the time the 25 posters are completed. So there could be some discussion at that point. So with that being said, I will now move on to poster number four. 
The title of our poster number four is Additive Manufacturing of Polymer Nanoparticle Composites. The authors are Sely Jambulkar, Wei Heng Zhu, Dharnidar Ravi Chandran, and Keenan Song. And our presenting author is Keenan Song. So I will now give the floor to Keenan Song if the presenter is present. But again, I'm not seeing the name here. So probably we'll again have to fall back to see if we have the video. Uh, OK, that is the one. Hello, so it is. I'll be presenting on behalf of Kenan Song on the topic additive manufacturing of polymer nanoparticle composites. With the growing needs in today's progressing world, better materials are required for providing satisfactory performances. Multilayered composite structures were developed by combining two immersible and different polymers to improve upon the properties of the of the individual raw material for user specific applications. They have been widely used in the packaging industry and with the proper selection of materials, they can also find applications as distributed feedback laser system, flame retardants, or robotics. They have been traditionally manufactured using the melt spinning technique. We believe that by using 3D printing, it is possible to expand the family of materials and also include nanoparticles for improving specific properties based on the user needs. Based on the direct ink writing 3D printing process, we designed and developed a new nozzle for forming multilayered composite structures. We have taken PVA solution and P solution of PVA and multiwatt carbon nanotube suspension as example for demonstration. First, the solutions are made separately and loaded into two separate syringe pumps connected to the nozzle on a 3D printing platform. The nozzle was designed based on the force assembly mechanism consisting of four separate parts as shown in the figure. The incoming solutions are split horizontally and stacked vertically in the layer multiplier. With addition of more layer multipliers, the number of layers increases in the order of 2 to the power n plus 1. With this technique, we were able to fabricate multilayered composite structures with 4 to 512 alternating layers with a minimum printing feature size of 4 microns in the 512 layer. The process also, process also enabled nanoparticle alignment, which were confirmed using Raman spectroscopy. The Raman scans were done in both vertical and horizontal direction to calculate the preferential uh, nanoparticle alignment factor. The composite structure and the nanoparticle alignment also helped in improving the mechanical properties, namely Young's modulus, ultimate tensile strength, and toughness, as compared to the pure PVA samples. The multi-layer structure with 64 alternating layers showed the best performance of all among all the samples. In conclusion, we successfully fabricated composite multi-layer structures with a minimum printing size of 4 microns in the 512 layers and demonstrated the improvement in nanoparticle alignment and mechanical properties. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ravi Chandran, for the talk. We'll now move on to poster number five. And the title for poster five is Synergistic Effect of Alginate BMP2 Umbilical Cord Serum Coated on 3D Printed PCL Biocomposite for Mastoid Obliteration model. The authors are Chul Ho Zhang, Un Ji, Gyun Hyung Kim. I hope I'm getting the names pronounced even partially decently. And our presenting author for this poster is Chul Ho Zhang. Again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the names correctly. So let's in fact, see if our presenter is here.
or any other presenter for this particular poster? Is any presenter present for this poster? Not hearing anybody identify themselves, then Dr. Ren, do we know if uh, uh, an NP4 is available? Um, no, we don't have we don't have PPT or videos oh. of number five. Okay. So it sounds like this one also we may have to skip, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we are learning as we go along. So then I'll move on to poster number six. Number five ended up also being in default. So I'll go to poster six now. The title for the poster is Atomically Dispersed N Graphene Quantum Dots Supported Dinitrosyl Iron Catalyst for Superior Oxygen Evolution Reaction. And the authors are Jia Yu Chang, Anil Kashale, Chen Wei Wu, Si Ting Chen, Jia Hui Yi, Tian Ming Li, and Ai Wen Peter Chen. And the presenter listed is Ai Wen Peter Chen. Is the presenter present? Do we have the presenter? Peter Chen. Or any other substitute stand in presenter? I'm not seeing the name here yes. on the yeah. list of presenters. So, and do we have the MP4? No, we don't have any material of this one. We do not. Okay, I'm so glad you are keeping a tab on which ones are there and which ones we don't. So we are missing a few. So in that case, we'll again skip this one and move to the next one, which will be the Poster number seven, let me read out uh, the title. Effect of copper and manganese on the microstructure and magnetic properties of aluminum, nickel, cobalt, copper, one minus X, FEMNX, that's the chemical formula, High Entropy Alloy. The authors are Raghavendra Kulkarni, Srinivas Vituri, and B.S. Murthy. And the presenting author is listed as Raghavendra Kulkarni. So is our presenting author present for this paper, for this poster? Dr. Ren looks like we are back to another one that appears to be in default. Yeah, we should escape <laughs> this one too. <laughs> okay, I hope we'll at least get a few that are here or that I, I know that we have 13 MP4. So that's at least could be the minimum number that we will be able to present to our broader audience here. So I will go on then to the number eight that I have here. Here's the title for poster number eight in this poster one session. The title is Improvement of Magnetic Properties and Flux Pinning for YBCO Composites Bulk. And we have a single author for this one. The author is Sang Hyun Lee. 
And the same author, Sang Hyun Lee, is listed as the presenting author. So let's see if we have Sang Hyun Lee. Apparently not. Do we have the MP4? Um, no. We don't have the MP4. We don't. But right. I think I just say him. And oh, you did see him? I, 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 just, I just see him, but he created this room. But um, maybe okay. he, will, he will come back. <laughs> Okay, so if you spot him at a later time, do give me a reminder, because I think we have given that so many are being defaulted, we have no problem managing the time, because it seems like we are saving way too much time. So let me know, then I will re-announce his name if he comes in later, okay? So uh, should I put a note out there saying that anyone coming in late, we can add them on? Oh, I'll keep an eye on it. That would be very helpful. Thank you again. So let me move on then to number nine, I believe. Poster number nine is titled Ferroelectric Effect in Zinc Ferrous Fe2 O4 Barium Titanate BATIO3 Core Shell Nanostructures. And the authors are Mangama, G. Mangama, A. Rajesh, B. Ramachandran, T. N. Sairam, and M. S. R. Rao. And our presenter is listed as G. Mangama. So as usual, two questions. One is, is the presenter here? Probably not. And Dr. Ren has very kindly has been keeping an eye on which MP4s we have. This one, do we have the MP4? Um, no, no. <laughs> okay, okay. So one more in the default. The situation is I can see we have 11 people listed as participants of which two of us are co-hosts. So we probably have nine who are involved with one or more of these posters. So let's move along. I think we'll go to number 10. The title here is Green Mirrorless Laser from Conjugated Polymer PFO CO PPV MEHB in film. And the authors are Mamdu Jamil Al Jafre, Sharad Prasad Rajendra, and Muhammad Sala Al Salhi Al Salhi. And our presenting author is listed as Mam Mamdu Jamil Al Jafre. Do we have Mahmoud Jamil Al Jafre? Once again, probably not. And what is the MP4 status? For uh, no, we don't have this MP4. We don't MP4. have that. Either. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will then move to number 11. The poster title is Microbian Fuel Cell Electric Power Generation. Before I read out the author names, just a quick question. This is just because I'm curious, uh, given that a fair number are not present here. Uh, Dr. Ren, are you aware if everybody was properly notified of the timing when this session was supposed to be? Uh, I think this should, because we have we have an app and we, we will uh, send them the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we will That's notify the time. Very true, because we all, we are in Dayton, Ohio. We have received all the notices plus the app, which we have downloaded. So I really don't quite understand what is going on here. So let me read out number 11 once again. Microbian fuel cell electric power generation. The authors are Serline Fourquet Bandera, 
Matias Bexoto Oliveira, Diogo Moraes de Souza, Denise Celeste Godua de Andrade Rodriguez. I hope I got that right. Clement Gilmar Clement Silva, Sergio Roberto Montoro, Michelle Liali Costa, and Edson Koshieri Botelho. And our presenting author is listed as Serlene Forque Bandera. And probably one more default from all appearances. And we can check for the MP4. Any we luck? We don't have on, this one. We don't have this one. Okay. Yeah, we have the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we do. That's great news. Thank you so much. At least then we get three minutes of technical talk. <laughs> so far, I'm just reading a bunch of stuff. But thank you again, Dr. Han. So the next one, which we do have, either the MP4 or the presenting author. The title is Development of Shuttle Adsorbent Between the Bottom and Surface of Water for Adsorption of Pollutants. The author, again, a single author here, Yoshihiro Mihara. And our presenting author, which I believe will be via a video clip, is Yoshihiro Mihara. Dr. Ren, please go right ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A minute. I believe in this time is 6 a.m. in Japan, I think. Oh, okay. So it doesn't look like he has joined in. So, yeah. so maybe we just, do we go ahead and play uh, the video? Share screen. Okay, thank you. I'd like to give a presentation on the title of Development and Sh Shuttle Adsorbent Between the Bottom and Surface of Water for Adsorption of Pollutants. Most of water-soluble pollutants, like heavy metal iron, must exist homogeneously in the body of water after sufficient period since in the flow. Although the use of adsorbent is one of the most promising methods to remove pollutants, the adsorbent should be selected as taking account of on the specific gravity of pollution pollutants in order to guarantee the sufficient contact with these pollutants. If we can develop an um, adsorbent which can repeat sinking and floating between the surface and bottom of water, the adsorbent may absorb portions in the bulk of water without stirring. Alginate hydrogel composite with controlled specific gravity and buoyancy was successfully developed, which can firstly sink in the bottom of water and then flow up on the surface of water after the process of adsorption. The arginate hydrogel composite was prepared by using the arginate solution containing glucose and yeast. Glucose in the arginate gel beads was converted to CO2 gas by fermentation process. The specific gravity of adsorbent gradually became lighter and began to float upward. During this development of the floating adsorbent, I found out an interesting adsorbent which repeats floating and sinking between the bottom and surface of water. The repeated movement of the arginate gel bead could be achieved through the introduction of a fermentation system with glucose and yeast. When the arginate gel beads floated on the surface of water, the accumulated CO2 gas bubbles in arginate gel beads might come off from the gel due to the decrease 
of the water pressure and the evaporation of water film covering around the bead and then the bead sank to the bottom. This behavior was repeated many times during the continuation of the fermentation process. This behavior was repeated many times during the continuation of the fermentation process. The vertical migration system shows faster removal of cesium than that one by the adsorbent without one. In order to apply the unique property into the adsorbent, the removal of cesium ion in a water column was demonstrated by using Prussian blue modified alginate gel beads, which have a repeated vertical migration system. That's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mihara. Uh, at this moment, one of the rare ones that was actually presented, but just for the, the broader audience once again, I think as we go down the list here, there are more that we do have MP4 recordings of. So I think we'll have at least several posters presented, either live or by MP4. So that's where we are right now. So we are now on to, I believe this must be number 13. Uh, the title of the next poster is Edge Effects for Non-Radiative Recombination in WS2. Once again, a single author, Ying Wang, and the presenting author is Ying Wang. So let us try to see if it probably will not be alive, but do we have the, the MP4? Oh, let me try. I think we don't have this one. You do not uh, have that so one. Thank you. Thank you. But there'll be several more, I'm sure, that are listed here with the MP4s. In which case, I will then, just to continue on, move to poster number 14. The title is Investigation of Partial Sintering of Alumina Containing Tetragonal Zirconia, ATZ, Ceramic Composites via Temperature-Dependent Impulse Excitation. The authors are Eva Gregorova and Willie Pabst. And the presenting author is Eva Gregorova. Is Eva Gregorova present? Dr. Ren, uh, do we have MP4 for this particular no, no, uh, poster? No, I don't, I don't have this one. Oh, OK, then I'll go to number, I think this must be 15. We are moving on to poster number 15 in this session, uh, the poster session one. The title is Photocatalytic H2 Generation with GC3N4 and MAL2O4, where M is barium or mag magnesium. And the authors are Takawira Joseph Mumanga, Eduardo Montes, and Luis Armando Diaz Torres. The presenting author is listed as Takawira Joseph. Mumanga. So let's see if the presenter is here or if we have the MP4. We have the 15th, yes. We do have this one? Yeah, we have the 15th. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ren. Share and
In this work, we present photocatalytic hydrogen generation using graffiti carbon nitride and alkaline metal based aluminates being uh, barium aluminate or magnesium aluminate. And so to carry out this work, we first uh, synthesized graffiti carbon nitride by pyrolysis using urea or theourea at 550 degrees Celsius for three hours. We carried out various characterization techniques to learn about the properties of our material and also carried out the hydrogen evolution reaction using this material as a photocatalyst with triethanolamine as the sacrificial agent. The other type of material that we prepared were, was the alkaline metal based aluminate, in this case being barium aluminate or magnesium aluminate, which were prepared by combustion synthesis at 600 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes to produce white powders that were then annealed at distinct temperatures under distinct uh, heat treatment atmospheres, that being carbon or air. We also evaluated this material using triethanolamide. This was the setup that we used to carry out the experiments. In the center, you can see we have our reactor that contains the photocatalyst mixed with deionized water. Apart from the UV lamp that was used uh, as a light source, we also carried out experiments using visible light. The visible light was uh, acquired from lead strips that were spiraled around the reactor as shown in the following images above. We had a higher, a high result, a high evol hydrogen evolution rate of 97 micromoles per gram of photocatalyst per hour using magnesium aluminate that was calcined in a carbon atmosphere. And the superior result was actually observed using graffiti carbon nitride. We achieved a high rate of 1,622 micromoles per gram of hydrogen, of, of per gram of uh, photocatalyst per hour using the theourea derived graffiti carbon nitride under uh, UV light, which uh, was our best result uh, under these conditions. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Takawira Joseph Mumanga, who presented this <clears throat> particular poster. And again, any follow-up questions and so forth relating to the research or interest in their work, use the chat link or you can correspond by email. And I do appreciate Dr. Ren reminding everyone that if anybody missed the sequence in which previous posters that we had kind of defaulted and moved on, then you can let us know and we can put you back on again. So with that having been said, uh, let's move on to number 16 on the list. The title for that one is Recoverable Energy Storage Properties on lead-based and lead-free ferroelectric thin films. The authors are Martando Rath, Soman Pradhan, and M.S. Ramachandra Rao. And the presenting author is M.S. Ramachandra Rao. So I believe this one is also one that we do not have the MP for. So if uh, MS Ramachandra Rao is present, please let us know, then we can get started. If not, we'll move on to the next one on the list. I'm not seeing that any of the presenters is here for this poster. And I don't believe we have the MP4. So Dr. Ren, should we just move on to the next one then? Yeah, yes, please. Very good, thank you. Okay. So now I'll announce poster number 17 in this session. 
The title for number 17 is Electro Polymerized Sorbents for Determination of Potential Endocrine Disruptors in Environmental Samples. And the authors are Justina Werner, Robert Frankowski, Re uh, Thomas Rebis, Thomas Greskowak, and Agnieszka Zgola Greskowak. Again, some tough names there. Uh, and the presenting author is Justina Werner. This one, we do have the MP4, but first we'd like to see if the presenter is present. And I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing uh, the presenter being here or any other co-author. So Dr. Ren, I guess we can play the MP4 for this one. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Justyna Werner, and I represent the Poznan University of Technology from Poland. I would like to present the study result of our research team, electropolymerized sorbents for determination of potential endocrine uh, disruptors in environmental samples. In this study, selected conducting polymers and their composites were electrochemically uh, deposited on the spring-shaped uh, stainless uh, steel support and then uh, were used for, for the extraction and pre-concentration of bisphenols and parabens from water surface uh, samples uh, before their uh, chromatographic determination. The first stage of the analytical procedure was based on the fabrication of polymeric layers, uh, PDOT or PDOT with lignosulfonate composite, uh, on the surface uh, of spring with the use of uh, an anodic electropolymerization process. Uh, then the sample solution was stirred during the extraction to speed up the transfer of the analytes uh, towards the polymer modified spring. And next, the spring was uh, immersed uh, in organic solvent and shaken to dissolve uh, the analyte uh, before chromatographic analysis. Conductive uh, coating polymers were characterized uh, by cyclic. Uh, voltimetry, uh, infrared spectra, and by images uh, taken with the scanning electron microscope. Optimization uh, of the electrochemical process was conducted to choose the most effective conductive uh, polymer uh, for the extraction of uh, bisphenols and uh, parabens and to assure the proper thickness uh, of the polymeric layer. Uh, then the conditions uh, for the extraction of analytes, uh, such as uh, uh, the pH of the sample and the extraction time, uh, were optimized. Uh, analytes desorption conditions were also uh, optimized. Uh, the presented method uh, was uh, validated to uh, bisphenols and parabens. Uh, and next, the presented methods were used to determine uh, parabens and bisphenols in samples of various uh, surface waters. Uh, to sum up, uh, successful electrochemical fabrication uh, of polymeric sorbents on a new geometry of the spring-shaped uh, uh, support uh, was used in this study 
and the proposed uh, method opens up uh, new possibilities for the production of uh, cost-efficient and environmentally friendly sorbent system, uh, which could be used uh, to remove uh, different contaminants from surface waters. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Here's the definition of Justina Werner and the co-authors for sharing your research with us. So oh. then we move on to a poster number 18 on our list. The title of this oh. poster is Functional Pickering Emulsion Extractant Based on Cyanex 923 Chitosan polyethylene glycol for selective extraction of yttrium from fluorescent lamp wastes. The authors are Lepo Calderon, Byron Gonzalo, Sandra Pavon, Martin Bertau, and Anna Maria Sastre. And our presenting author for this poster is Byron Gonzalo Lepo Calderon. So this one also, I believe on our list shows as an MP4, but if the presenter is here, then we can have a live presentation. If the presenter is here, please do unmute and identify yourself. Otherwise, we'll play back the MP4. It appears we may just have to play back the MP4. Dr. M, help please. Thank you. This, this is a uh, uh, PPT version, and I don't know if you can say it clearly. Oh, I mean, this is a true poster. <laughs> Maybe we can count down for three minutes for, for everyone to watch this poster. This one, the video has a problem, right? Yeah, this is okay, a PPT. So, this is just a oh, PPT. This one was a PPT. Okay, this was one of the PPTs. All right, then in that case, we go to number 19. Uh, and once again, a reminder that if any presenter came in late, please put a notice on the chat box so that we can incorporate your talk back into the session because we do have quite a bit of leftover time. But I'll read off number 19 at this point, poster number 19. Title is, How the Electrode Potential Selects the Dual Electronic Structure of Charged Metal Molecule Interfaces, Surface Enhanced Raman Scattering of cyanide adsorbed, adsorbed on nanostructured silver electrodes. The authors are Samuel Valdivia, Daniel Aranda, Francisco Garcia Gonzalez, and uh, there's a couple others, uh, Francisco J. Avila Ferrer, Juan Soto, Isabel Lopez Tocon and Juan Carlos Otero. And the presenting author is Juan Carlos Otero. 
We are again looking over. I'm not seeing one Carlos Otero here. So consequently, if we do have the MP4, here it is. Thank you, Dr. M. Greetings, my name is Francisco García González. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Physical Chemistry at the University of Malaga, Spain. And I'm here to present a work of us regarding how the weight number of the scene rates of cyanide changes with electric potential when attached to an structural silver electrode. Now, this work has been carried out theoretically and experimentally. Theoretically, we have that the silver electrode is far too big and complex to be calculated, so we have used this model of stick like silver clusters with charge with this magnitude called effective charge, which is calculated by dividing the charge by the number of atoms, which is to simulate the electric potential. Now, the motive of this work is explaining this experimental data of the formation with number versus electric potential, where we have here three regions from which to explain especially regions A and B. It has been suggested that these regions arise from different complexes with, complexes with different stoichiometries, but we discarded it since it would imply that a negative ion has more affinity to a negative systems than to positive systems, which makes no sense when talking about statics, and which justifies our use of only one cyanide in our model. Now, regarding confirmation, we have that the top one is the most stable, so that's why we use the top one for our model, at, with cyanide attached by carbon and nitrogen. So we have here our calculated data, here FFT charge versus energy, and here injected charge versus energy. And in both cases, we see that the positive systems are more impervious to change, have a stronger electronic structure than the negative ones. Now we're talking surfaces, and we're talking surfaces, this will imply that for positive systems we have a case of chemisorption, and for negative systems we have a case of physisorption. If we take a look at the calculated wave numbers, we see that region A will be the, the positive ones here for top C, and region B the negative ones. We discarded the term conformation as experimentally relevant, since the change of the wave numbers will imply that we will see two lines of data and the top C is, most, is more stable so we have concluded that we see here the top C conformation as for region C we propose that it's due to bidentate complexes which arise from mm, oxidized uh, silver atoms and more positive potentials since it disappears when we change the ion from sulfate to chloride which is more which has more affinity to, to, to silver. Now, as a conclusion, we have seen here through experimental data and theoretical calculations that we can explain these mm, regions and these trends in the basis of two electronic structures in the surface, which are chemisorption and physisorption. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and stay safe. Okay, thank you very much, Juan Carlos Otero and the co-authors for sharing your research with us and continuing conversation can be had using any of the three uh, channels that we have, chat or email or a little bit of conversation at the end of all the presentations. If we have a, I'm sure there will be some leftover time. So we'll move on to poster number 20 for this poster one session. The title of poster 20 is Informing Tunable Biocomposite Design with Fiber Formation in Spiders and Silkworm Worms, which we are looking at right there. The authors are Hannah Johnson, Catherine Adams, Christopher Leana, Salvador Vallejo, and Gregory P. Holland. And the presenting author is listed as Hannah Johnson. So I'm seeing something on the screen right now. I'm almost excited to think maybe we do have a live presenter here. Or is this another actual? Uh, wait a minute, to... I think. Uh, I think we need to unmute. Yeah, I see Hannah Johnson. I see Hannah Johnson right here. Can you guys hear me now? 
Yes, we do. Very nice. Awesome. Thank you so All much. All right. <laughs> well, I'm Hannah. I'm a grad student in Dr. Greg Collins' group at San Diego State University. And today I'm presenting um, Informing Tunable Biocomposite Design with Fiber Formation in Spiders and Silkworms. So if you look at the uh, stress strain curves for several different silks, you can see that there are a diverse range of mechanical properties. The major ampulate silk, which is used as a spider's lifeline, is very strong, while the acinoform silk, which is used by spiders for wrapping prey, um, is more extensible. But before we can make tunable composites from these silks, we need to understand if the mechanical properties are a result of the protein sequence itself or if it's a result of the silk spinning process. So if you look at the protein sequence, there's these really long repeat regions that are not highlighted. They have a lot of glycine and alanine in them. And we're interested in these regions because in the starting material in the spider, um, they're intrinsically disordered. But when you get to the fiber, they have more beta sheet uh, content. And this is a result of the silk spinning process where you have the silk enters this duct region and there's salt exchange where divalent anions get, um, uh, they come in and replace monovalent anions. There are shear forces, which are important for alignment. And then there's this acidic pH gradient, which is necessary for fibrillization. But we don't know yet how the proteins develop inside of this duct region. So this is a question I'm interested in answering. And I'm investigating this using um, NMR uh, electron microscopy and infrared imaging. So NMR gives us information about atomic level interactions, but before I can study this in detail, I need to increase the signal of my proteins of interest. So in order to look at these repeat regions, I fed silkworms isotopically labeled phenylalanine and alanine. And you can see from both the solid state and the solution NMR spectra that I collected that these repeat region amino acids are coming through quite nicely. Um, I'm also using infrared imaging where I fix spider silk glands with glutaraldehyde and look at the slices um, on an IR microscope and I can collect the spectra. So at the tail end of, of the silk gland where the proteins are synthesized, it looks like there's more helical random coil structure based on the absorbance at 1650. Whereas you get closer to the duct end where fiber formation starts, there's this little yeah, shoulder that in indicates the beta character. And then finally, I'm using transmission electron microscopy. I'm mimicking the gland environment with different negative stains. So ammonium molybdate stain has uh, divalent anions in it. So I see both the native-like structure and these droplets, whereas urinal acetate is more acidic. Um, I also did multiple washes of water and you start to see this fibrillization occurring. So for my future work, I'm planning on continuing the NMR studies, and then I'm also working on doing cryo-electron microscopy um, so that I can look at these proteins in a more native environment. So with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Anna Johnson. And <laughs> uh, you are very precious for this session because we have not had very many live presentations, so we are absolutely thrilled to have you here. And I'm assuming there may also be more coming up. So once again, for the other audience members, if there are questions, uh, discussions, please either use the chat link or else uh, send email or other means of contact. And once we wrap everything up, if there's more time left over, we can have further discussions. So once again, thank you so much for presenting your work to us. We'll now go on then to poster 21 in this session. The title of this poster is Investigation on Electrochemical Hydrogen Evolution Using Different Crystal Phases of TAS2. And we have a single author, Hamid Gorbani Shiraz. And the presenting author is Hamid Gorbani Shiraz. So let's see if the author is present here. I'm not seeing the name on, on our uh, participant list. So therefore, Dr. Ren, if we have the MP4, maybe we yeah. can 
introduce that. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Welcome to a brief post presentation on electrochemical hydrogen generation using tantalum disulfide. Uh, pictures on the left here uh, shows that uh, how basically the process look in the lab synthesis characterization and test. And pictures on the uh, right basically tells us uh, how hydrogen could be formed from proton using the electrons that are uh, uh, oriented through the catalyst. We took two different phases of the tantalum disulfide and then on your uh, left you can see that how they are uh, architected. Uh, the evolution reaction in acid uh, expresses that the over potential for the 3R sample is almost one fourth of the that of 1T. The same more or less goes with the base. Then we have a Tafel plot uh, that uh, basically uh, shows us the same slope for the 3R and 1T, meaning that the uh, the formation reaction is uh, governed using the same uh, mechanism for both. Uh, then we have the impedance measurement, uh, the lower resistance for the 3R compared to 1T, meaning higher the electric, electrical conductivity. Uh, the other electrochemical specification like capacitance for the 3R is almost 250 times compared higher than the 1T uh, and the density of uh, reaction size for the 3R is almost 10,000 times higher than that of 1T. So the conclusion is that the structure and the configuration of the atoms play a, a key role for the evolution reaction and the sulfur at the uh, basically border of the crystal units or the nanoshades could improve the formation reaction and uh, the higher performance of the three or might be related to the higher diffusion rate of the protons uh, also, we know that based on the result, the location of the reaction sites might be on sulfur atoms or close to the sulfur atoms. And last but not least, the electron perturbation, given that the uh, uh, more concentrated active reaction sites in the 3R uh, uh, could cause the active, higher activated basal and the edge sites in the 3R sample. Thanks for your attention and uh, I would be pleased to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Hamid Gurbani Shiraz. And if there are questions or discussions, please post questions on the chat link that we have, or else uh, we can also try uh, a Q&A at the end of the whole sequence once we finish up. Plus, I think Dr. Ren has pointed out that if anybody came in later, they can also be put right back on the presentation schedule uh, because we do have uh, quite a bit of time left. So with that, let me move on to poster number, I believe, 22. And the title for the next poster is Construction and Comparison of several different biopolymer coatings on ferric oxide core shell nanoparticles produced for doxorubicin delivery. And the authors are Maid Gupt Bekaroglu and Sevim Isi. Again, I may have distorted the pronunciation of the names. I do apologize for that. The presenting author is Maid Gox Baker Rodeo. So that's number 22. And we see we see that presenter right here. Can we? Yeah. So it looks like uh, Maid Gox of Bekaroglu is here. So if you can upload your video talk, 
we can I get can... started. Okay. I was unmuted, but now it's okay. I think that everyone. You're can... okay. All right. And I do apologize if I mispronounced your name. No, it's okay. It's a hard name to pronounce. Oh. <laughs> Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gökçe. Uh, today I'm going to present my poster uh, about core shell nanoparticles, specifically designed for uh, anti tumor drug delivery. Let me zoom the poster a little bit. Okay, uh, in this il uh, illustration, we can see our particle spinal structure. We coated iron oxide nanoparticles with uh, biopolymers and then loaded uh, doxorubicin, which is an anti-tumor drug, onto the surface. Um, in this study, we used several different uh, polymers in order to assess their uh, effect uh, influence at the final, uh, final particle structure. <clears throat> if I can move on to the methods, here we uh, used um, um, hydroxyethyl ethylene cellulose, nanocrystalline cellulose, polyvinyl pyrodolone, and copper carrageenan uh, to uh, assess the biopolymer influence uh, at the final structure of the particle. We uh, obtained colloidal characterization, drug loading, uh, and in vitro cytotoxicity for each polymer coatings in this study. If we look at the rheological results here given, uh, I will talk about this first graph. The other ones are all the same. Um, the uncoated iron oxides show the shear thickening behavior, uh, flow behavior. But when we coated the uh, iron oxide particles, the flow transformed into Newtonian flow, which is what we wanted. This behavior was observed for each uh, polymer. Uh, here we can see nanocrystalline cellulose and uh, kappa carrageenan and uh, hydroxyethylene cellulose. They all converted the flow to Newtonian flow. When we look at the electrokinetical properties and the size of each uh, coating, we see, we see that um, all uh, coatings except nanocrystalline cellulose uh, covered particle surfaces completely, but nanocrystalline cellulose uh, seems to only partially cover the uh, iron oxide surface. Um, Later, when we look at the particle size, let me zoom a little bit more further. When we look at the par average particle size of each coating, we can observe that each uh, coating increased the complete uh, particle size, which was uh, expected. And finally, we, as I mentioned before, we loaded doxorubicin onto the particle surface. Uh, we obtained the loading efficiency for each uh, biopolymer coatings. Here, I think it's the writing is a little small, but uh, I can tell you here the uh, highest drug loading amount was achieved for polyvinyl prodolone, and the lowest was for kappa carrageenan. And finally, we tested each particle uh, with human breast cancer cell lines, and we we uh, obtained the cell viability at each particle treatment concentration. Here we can see that at high concentrations, except kappa carrageenan, all coatings uh, performed similarly to pure docs, which is represented with the orange bar here, uh, which indicates us that if these particles were to be used in such applications, the proper concentration of the particles should be uh, determined before the application because at the low cons at lower concentrations, there seems to be not uh, any significant toxicity to cancer cell lines. In conclusion, uh, even though each particle coating was successful enough to kill cancer cell lines, hydroxyethylene cellulose was much more uh, affected, uh, effective and uh, was much more suitable to be used in uh, targeted uh, delivery, drug delivery applications. Uh, that's it from me. If you have any questions, I don't know if we have time or not, <laughs> but I can answer any questions. Thank you for listening. Yes, thank you so much for presenting your research with us, with our audience. And 
This one did go over a little bit the three minute mark, but that's quite all right because we do have some spare time. And as usual, if there are questions from our audience on research topics and so on, please feel free to use the chat link or send email to our authors, especially our presenting author. Thank you once again. And so uh, we'll actually go on to the next one. Okay, thanks. We'll now uh, move on to uh, paper number 23, I believe. And paper 23, poster 23, is titled Engineered Biomaterials for Combination Cancer Immunotherapy. And the author is listed as James Moon. The presenting author is also James Moon. So let's see if we have James Moon here. And I'm not seeing the name. In which case, we'll probably do our fallback, which is the MP4 presentation. So here is the MP4 presentation. Uh, Hello, my name is James Moon. I'm a professor from University of Michigan in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Biomedical Engineering. I'll give a very brief overview of ongoing work in my lab where we use nanomaterials to improve cancer immunotherapy. As you probably know, uh, cancer immunotherapy is revolutionizing how we are treating cancer patients. Uh, and one particular reagents that are getting a lot of attention is uh, CGAS sting pathway for immune activation. These activate what's called the sting receptors in immune cells. And these dicyclic dinucleotides can induce very st strong sting activation to get type 1 interferon response that can melt tumors away in different tumor models. But it's hard to deliver these uh, uh, for systemic route because these are small molecules that disseminate quite rapidly after uh, injection. So we designed a nanoparticle system that allows us to do a systemic injection of these uh, acyclic dinucleotide-based sting activation. Uh, to achieve this, we combine with a, a slight, um, a small bit of metal, manganese. Uh, why? Because um, by adding manganese, we can significantly enhance the potency of sting agonist by sometimes 10 to 70 folds, depending on different molecules. And they form these nanocrystals that we can wrap around with the lipid vesicles to have a very stable nanostructures. And in this paper, we have shown that uh, after intratumoral or intravenous injection, they induce immune responses and uh, serve as a very potent immune activator against the tumor cells. So just to show you a very quick overview of our work, we implant tumors in sub flank. This is a very challenging, the 16 f melanoma model. And we give IV, intravenous injection of our particles delivering sting agonists. And this uh, CMP is our particle that has a manganese uh, in the core. And we see very long extended animal survival for this um, animals treated with our particles. In contrast, if you give a uh, sting agonist that are in clinical trials, such as uh, Ajuro and uh, GSK's compound, they were not as uh, effective as our control uh, particle groups. And also liposomes that served as a control also did not show uh, dramatic anti-tumor efficacy. So all in all, we developed a nanoparticle system that allows us to do IV injection with a very potent anti-tumor efficacy. Another line of work we are uh, working on is um, something called um, uh, inulin. This is a dietary fiber that's commonly found in uh, plant roots, such as a chicory and Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, it's a polysaccharide that modulates the gut microbiome to induce a uh, strong T cell response. Basically, in our work uh, published recently, we showed that when inulin is formed into an inulin gel and given by oral route in mice, it gets uh, coated onto the colon layers, uh, serving as a nutrient source for microbes residing in the colon. And these 
microbes will secrete beneficial metabolites by fermenting inulin gel. And we found out that short chain fatty acids from these microbes can turn T cells into super uh, cytotoxic T cells, a uh, subset of T cells called uh, stem like memory CD T cells. So, in this tumor model, in mouse model, what we have shown is that uh, mice given inulin gel by oral route plus immune checkpoint blockers by systemic route can significantly enhance uh, anti tumor efficacy. Uh, uh, compared with giving immune checkpoint blockers alone or immune checkpoint blocker combined with a native inulin. So all in all, we're, what we have shown is uh, that biomaterials uh, that can tune the gut microbiome, uh, thereby activating host immune responses against the cancer. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and the members in my lab who did the work, including Dr. Kai Han and Sushi Sun. Uh, and I also want to thank our uh, funding agencies. Thank you. Dr. Moon, for sharing your research with our audience here. And before I move on to paper number, I think, 24, uh, just a quick uh, point to be made. I think Dr. Ren has put that up on the chat uh, link here that uh, posters 1, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 16. These have not yet been presented. So if any presenter happens to have come in later, please uh, let Dr. Ren know she is watching out for that. Then we can put you back on track. Thank you very much. And we'll now go to number 24. The paper title is Ultrasound as Functional Influence Tool on FEB Pair Association in Silicon Solar Cells. And the authors are Oleg Olik, Vitaly Kotsilyov, Vlasiuk, Viktor Vlasiuk, and Roman Korkishko. And this will be presented by Oleg Olik. So I believe, again, we have a live presenter, which we are very glad to see. So here okay. is Oleg Olik. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Oleg Olik. Me and my co-authors represent the Russian National University of Kiev and the Lashkarov Institute of Semiconductor Physics, Ukraine, and want to present work ultrasound as a functional influence tool on iron boron pair association in silicon solar cell. It is well known that ultrasound can effectively drive the defect state in semiconductors. The aim of our work is to investigate experimentally the iron boron pair association in silicon solar cell under ultrasound loading condition. The standard silicon solar cell with back surface field configuration were under investigation. The kinetic of short circuit current after intense illumination have been measured to evaluate pair association. The measurements were carried out both with and without ultrasound loading. The Cooper foil was used to prevent piezoelectric field penetration into solar cell. In the case of ultrasound loaded, the longitudinal and transverse acoustic waves were used. The intrinsic recombination, the shock lead recombination were taken into account and the time of iron bore association were determined from short circuit current kinetic. It was relieved that ultrasound loading leads to accelerating of iron bore pike association. The effect depends on the ultrasound intensity. The next slide demonstrates that decrease in association time is linearly depends on the intensity at the initial stage, and then effect of saturation is observed. Besides, the effect is weakened slightly with frequency increase. The using the user of transverse waves has less efficient. Simultaneously, iron concentration does not influence practically on quantitative parameters of acoustically induced acceleration in iron-boron pair association. 
Apart from above, the efficiency ultrasound action decreases at low temperature. It is known that by association time depends on diffusivity of mobile iron ion. Therefore, the most likely cause of relieved effect is decrease in iron atom migration energy under ultrasound action. The calculation shown that this decreases up to 10 electron volts. Therefore, the conclusion is following. The effect of acoustically induced acceleration of iron boron pair association in the consular cell has relieved. The efficiency of ultrasound influence decreases with acoustic phase frequency rising and the temperature drop, it does not depend on iron concentration. The effect saturation with ultrasound intensity increase is observed. The analysis has shown that these effects are caused by acoustically inducing decrease in the migration energy of iron atom. I am waiting for your question at the email. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pollick. And if there are questions, we can pause a second or two, or else, as usual, we can engage our authors through the chat link. And there's also emails by which you can correspond. And finally, we, we may open up the floor at the end of all the presentations. We technically have one more left. And then there may be a few others who didn't present in the original schedule, then we may put them back on. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So then with that, we are actually officially into poster number 25, the last one for this session. Uh, and the title for that one is Rechargeable Magnesium Battery Cathodes Based on Fluorine-Free M Exenes. And the authors are Frode Haskiold Fagali, Henning Kaland, Jacob Hadler Jacobsen, Zhao Hui Wang, Sver M. Selbach, Tor Grande, Nils P. Wagner, and Kiel Wick. And our presenter, I see the presenter present. Again, a very pleasant discovery for us is Frode Hasiold Fagali, and I apologize if I did not say the name correctly. So, Dr. Fagali, if you can put up your presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess you should have my presentation as a video. So, yes. if you could present yes, that, that would be better. Yes, we have. Would you rather that it be played back? Then, yeah, I think Dr. Ren can play it back. Yeah, wait a minute. By the no way, problem. hello from Thank Norway. You. Hello. Good, good to have you here. I think Dr. Ren will present your, your video right yeah. now. Thank nice. you. There we go. All right. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to a short presentation about my work related to rechargeable magnesium battery cathodes based on fluorine-free vaccines. In order to meet the future battery demand, we might need to look beyond lithium-ion batteries. One of the most promising alternatives are rechargeable magnesium batteries, which allow for the use of magne magnesium metal anodes with a reasonably low reduction potential and a very high theoretical capacity. This may allow for comparable energy densities to today's lithium ion batteries. Since magnesium also is among the top 10 most abundant elements, a magnesium battery chemistry could potentially result in cheaper batteries as well. However, to date, there are no competitive cathode materials that allow for reversible reactions with magnesium ions. Therefore, I have been working with a family of two-dimensional materials known as maxines, as a possible way to integrate magnesium ions in between the two-dimensional flakes. Unfortunately, we have been unable to measure any intercalation of magnesium ions. This is demonstrated by the low capacity uh, obtained upon cycling. In comparison, you see a much higher capacity for hybrid cells where we introduced lithium ions to the electrolyte, indicating that lithium ions easily intercalate in the same setup. To explain these results, we calculated the migration barriers and intercalation energies of lithium and magnesium ions in between various maxine compositions. 
The green area here illustrates ideal values with relatively low migration barriers and sufficiently high voltages for a practical cathode material. Here we see that lithium ion intercalation, shown in purple, shows much better performance than magnesium intercalation for most mixing compositions. We also see a great difference in properties for different chemical compositions. Uh, as shown here, um, the most viable composition for magnesium intercalation is oxygen terminated vanadium maxine. To test if we could change the maxine terminations, we decided to look into hydrolysation with the proposed reaction given here. This figure shows the calculated values for delta G for different ratios between water and HF gas as a function of temperature. It illustrates how the re reaction should be thermodynamically favorable at high enough temperatures and high enough gas ratios. Unfortunately, my experimental results have not been very promising, as the XOD diffractogram indicates. We see a clear reduction of the 002 peak of the maxine after hydrolysation at 400 degrees Celsius. It seems as if the maxine decomposes under such elevated temperatures, making hydrolysation an unfeasible method for changing the termination groups. So even though magnesium intercalation in maxines still might be possible, these results demonstrate some of the difficulty in achieving it. With that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and I would also like to thank all these people here for making my work possible. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, hello, I think that's Dr. Magelli, is it? Thank you very much for being here and thanks for sharing your research with, with our audience. And we'll wait to see if there are questions that may come up via chat or later perhaps by email or we'll maybe open the floor a little bit afterwards to see if there are ongoing discussions. Okay, thank you once again. So I think that was our poster number 25, which I had on my list here for this poster session one. And I think we are kind of, we have been hoping that some of the ones that were not presented would have come back by now, but I don't believe we are seeing any new names here. Uh, Dr. Ren, do you agree? Yeah, and no uh, I didn't receive any messages. <laughs> That's true. We saw your note earlier on. So would you suggest we wait out a little bit longer because we are at we have a, almost a half hour officially left uh, or what should be the proper mode of action because i know everyone's probably also once you are finished with this you have other obligations so either we have the option to close out the session or open the floor for some discussion, but we just have what we have eight people of which two of us are co-hosts. So there are really, uh, there are six presenters who are here. So it appears to, we could maybe, should we be waiting out the half hour? <laughs> I'm not even sure what the proper action might be. In other words, if someone missed their presentation, are we obligated to wait all the way until you know, 3 p.m. Pacific time? Because that's the scheduled time. So I, I assume that the proper answer is we should wait. Yeah, well, we can wait for a couple minutes and they will can finish the session. Okay, okay, because it's supposed to close out at 3 p.m. and we are at just past 2.30 for the Pacific time. All right, then we'll be sort of on standby right now then. Uh, does that sound okay to you, Dr. Ren? Yeah, I think it's okay. Okay, then let's be on standby for a little bit if anyone joins in. I hope we'll get the notice for that. Okay, so I'll just put that as like we are on standby. Put that for everyone. Okay. Just, oh. 
They don't seem to have the poster award in this conference. And that came in as a question, I believe, right? Uh, Dr. Ren, are you aware of any poster awards? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not aware of anything like I, that. I think there is no. But the, I think I need to. I, I need to just uh, write down who is not here, so in, in case. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think you have listed those already, and yeah. I marked them off by numbers, as you have the sequential numbers. So. We do know who are not here. Okay. And and the conference continues into tomorrow, right? That's my understanding. Oh, uh, this is a three-day conference. Oh, it is. So it goes on till the 20th? Okay, okay. Because some of my students have their talks tomorrow, I believe. That's how I was kind of locked into the 19th. Okay, so, so there's more coming, obviously, and one would hope that there'd be a lot more participation. Oh, poster winners will be announced at the end of the conference. Yeah. And they will get free. Oh, okay. Get free recipient for next year. Okay. Apparently, who are uh, present have more chance to get the poster worth. Uh, you have not heard from anyone so far, right? Out of the right, right. few that they present. Okay, 